When they talk about social justice, they're not talking about social justice. Most of the time, they just mean revenge. Mm -hmm. Correct. You know, when they talk about racism and anti-racism, they don't mean anti-racism. They mean revenge racism by a different group of people. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was disaster touriseming in uh, in uh, uh, the state uh, of Oregon and uh, <laughs> ahead of the election around the time of the election and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's easy to joke about it but as, as everyone here knows uh, we're dealing with as Travis said fundamentalists here people who've been indoctrinated into a fundamentalist mindset and you know we're we're, we're quite good in this era of identifying when people are falling into Scientology or, or some other uh, crazy sect. And, and yet the biggest uh, growing sect of our time has been going on, growing underneath us without being identified. So anyone who does identify that and wants to push back against that and, and take that sect apart, to deconstruct the deconstructionists, as I think of it, uh, I'm on board. And uh, I have to say, from everything I've seen so far, it looks just terrific. Uh, but there are good signs that, that people are, are opposing it. You know, it, just in recent weeks, we've seen uh, an increasing pushback against it from France. Uh, uh, it's uh, quite uncommon to hear somebody mm -hmm. with my accent praising the French. But, uh, <laughs> but here we go. I mean, uh, Emmanuel Macron and academics across France have been saying, no, this, uh, this is uh, anti-academic, anti-thought. Uh, you know, I mean, France is, of course... Uh, partly responsible for this because a sort of form of French thought went across to America, was picked up by maniacs, and now uh, they're trying to export it everywhere else. But actually, as I say, it's, it's, it's a source of some hope that in France, at any rate, from the top of government, to, you know, very significant figures in French thought, they're saying, no, this, this doesn't, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't cut it. Uh, this isn't w what you pretend it is. It isn't academia. It isn't thought. It isn't philosophy. It's dogmatic politics. That attempts, of course, to bully everyone by presenting itself as incredibly intelligent and intimidating people. But I think I think the more people uh, uh, see other people not being intimidated uh, by it, uh, the more they won't be intimidated by uh, by it themselves. And and Travis and Peter and you, Dave. I mean, we all know examples of that. Mm -hmm. Many many people who at first just don't know what has happened when this juggernaut comes at them. Uh, and of course, for many people, it comes at them at their own dinner table in their own household with, with kids they've sent away to college and they've come back stupider. And uh, they don't know what to do when this juggernaut comes at them at first. But by now, and with Travis's film and Peter's work and the work of, of many other people as well, people do now know, they can now know what it is, and they can know how to dodge this juggernaut and even maybe turn it round. The conservatives are naturally more suspicious of ideas mm -hmm. uh, than leftists. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strange paradox in uh, political thought. Uh, those of us who are more to the right uh, often have to juggle with this paradox. Uh, but the suspicion of ideas on the ideological right comes about for very good reason. Uh, it comes about, I mean, we, we read it in Edmund Burke, most famously, uh, a, a fear of, of where ideas lead in mm -hmm. politics. And, and this is very, of course, this is hard, particularly for, for younger people to resist, because if somebody comes at you with a, an all-explaining idea and says, this is the great revolution of your time, the young are disproportionately likely to want to jump in on that because who doesn't want to have a bit of that action? It's only when you're older, uh, apart from being more experienced, that you can see, well, that action includes a lot of blood, a lot of crushed skulls, a lot of wrecked lives and ruined opportunities. And it's not so cute when you look at it in the rear view mirror. Mm. So th that sort of age and youth uh, experience, I also think is reflected in the political debate on the left and right, that there is a suspicion of ideas. And that you, you see that even in the everyday dialogue in the media and elsewhere. The right tends to say, oh, we, we, or at its best, says, we don't want any of that nonsense and combat it away. Mm -hmm. But parts of the left, certainly, too much of it, as Peter well knows, sort of fall into the discussion. It's what Peter said about the importance of the zero tolerance strategy towards this. They, they, they take a bit of it. You know, people start talking about equity and social justice, and people slip even into the language. When they talk about social justice, they're not talking about social justice. Most of the time, they just mean revenge. Mm -hmm. Correct. You know, when they talk about racism and anti-racism, they don't mean anti-racism. They mean revenge racism by a different group of people. Mm -hmm. and, 
and, and just more and more people have to realize that even the language has been totally polluted. So I'm with Peter. You just can't take on uh, bits of the language. You can't concede bits of it. This is a deeply uh, ugly uh, and, uh, ideology. It aspires to be totalitarian. Wherever it gets a grip, as in parts of Portland, it wrecks everything that it has in its purview. I hope more and more people realize that. Uh, and uh, I think they are realizing it. Uh, but m the, the thing I, I, I observe that's most heartening, really, and I think I said this to Travis and Peter uh, when we were filming, is that one of the things I found most heartening is that there are weird people, I think like all of us, uh, um, there are weird people who hold on to concepts like truth and put a high premium on them and not going along with lies that they're told to go along with. And this throws up really curious people. Like mm -hmm. It throws up some very religious people who just, uh, uh, from, their, from their, their religious teaching, they just, they just don't want to repeat lies they're told. It throws up atheists. Uh, there's no uh, um, clear sweep on that one. It throws up people on the ideological left and people on the ideological right, people who are fascinated by politics and people who never really gave a damn about politics until this came along. And so, so what strikes me is by now there's a very interesting coterie of people around the world of every imaginable background who just don't like being told to lie and will not go along with the lie. And sometimes their teachers, they crop up around the world. And this is the interesting thing. And we saw it recently with the uh, Manhattan school teacher. If you don't go along with it, the short term, you pay an extraordinary price. But you know you're on to something mm -hmm. because of the extraordinary interest that comes around you when you start saying that you don't believe this. You see, if one teacher in a school says, hang on. We're being segregated along racial lines in the school, and I don't think that's a good thing. You will immediately be in serious trouble, as the Manhattan school teacher was with your boss, and you might even lose your Paul job Rossi. in the short term. Mm -hmm. Paul Rossi. You might even lose your job in the short term, as he did. Always. I gather he's got a job now. But, uh, and any child would be very, very lucky to be taught by him. Uh, but, but the point is, is that you immediately attract all this attention because of the number of people who don't yet have the guts to do it. But this suggests that the people who are doing it are on to something. The movement is only going to grow. I don't, I'm not at all surprised at this stage that the Kendys and the D'Angelos and all the other hucksters and fraudsters of the age are talking a higher and higher rhetoric and talking more and more angrily. Why are they doing it? Because they're starting to notice that they're not being regarded as the self-appointed sheriffs that they think they are. They came into town and literally uh, announced themselves <laughs> sheriff of the entire moral landscape. And then these irritating people, a Bogosian there, a Travis Brown there, a, a Dave Rubin here, they start to pop up and say, I don't respect your credentials. You don't have the right to be sheriff. And more and more people are doing it. They're losing their power. It's going to be ugly as they get out, but they're going to get out. You know, it's I'll funny, I, Douglas, I usually don't come to you for the Pollyannish response, but you're, you're giving me the, oh, the, sil the silver no, Dave, lining. I, I, Dave. I have fought so many unwinnable battles in my life. I know an unwinnable battle when I see one. This is a winnable battle. Totally. Ah, I love that, Pete, totally. go ahead. This, it's inherently unsustainable. I think they're being found out. I think they're being seen through. And that's the most dangerous thing for any intellectual movement like with any politician. It's not when people dislike you, it's when they see through you. Mm -hmm. And we can see through this now. I made a, a lot of jokes in the madness of crowds about this, about the execrable way in which these people write. Uh, you can tell in, in, in the prose that they don't really know what <laughs> they're doing. Because if they knew yeah. what they were doing, they wouldn't write so badly. <laughs> you only write as badly as they do when you're trying to cover over a lie or you don't know what you're saying. Uh, so I think the intellectual pattern is being seen through. Uh, I don't think there's much more left in it. I think that they are clearly, the people you describe as intellectual drivers, clearly uh, uh, working with uh, an increasingly inflated currency. Uh, they have called everyone Hitler now. Every, literally everybody is a racist. Um, everybody is a fascist. Uh, they've devalued the entire currency. Uh, and I don't think uh, that they've got much further to go on this road. I think they're in a, 
the situation of Zimbabwe and hyperinflation with their currency. I think it's a very dangerous position for them to be in. They will continue to wheel around their wheelbarrows full of excrement. Uh, but there is no reason why, as the years go on, everybody will continue to pay them the attention that they have. Uh, I think most people will continue to look at them with some interest. Once they've seen through, they will discard these people. They will keep going, but their thoughts will be discarded. Just as surely as it, it only took a, a few extraordinary people like Solzhenitsyn mm -hmm. um, to muck the whole game up for the, 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 the crass, uh, far-left Marxist apologists of totalitarianism in the late 20th century, very few of them, by the way, ever actually, as Peter knows, very few of them ever actually said, oh, okay, guys, the game's up. They just slithered away. They slithered away. And that's what will happen with these guys. At some point in the future, Robin DiAngelo will be writing books still. It's just no one will be reading. Can I, can I add one last thing? Which yes, just of course. To, just, just one last thing, which is we do need to get these people out of the way, but anyone who changes their mind needs to be forgiven. Sure. Quite Absolutely. hundred percent. Very Great important ending. point. Yep. Hey, we've, we've got a redemption narrative, which is that we're humans and we're flawed. And I think that gets to right. Pete's earlier point that they don't have that narrative. They, they kind of want you to bow forever.